Hey guys, my name is Scott Herter and I'm a time-lapse and hyperlapse photographer. And in this video, I'm gonna be talking about my 13 tips to get better time lapses. The goal here is to give you actionable steps that you can use today to up your time-lapse game immediately and avoid that dreaded flicker. Tip number one, shoot in raw. A raw image means that the photograph is uncompressed and completely editable. So all of the camera settings, such as exposure, contrast, white balance, etc., all of that can still be changed or controlled by you. So do yourself a favor, and shoot in RAW. Tip number two, shoot in full manual. The reason being is that any of the automatic or semi-automatic modes, the camera can't make 100% perfectly repeating actions in these modes. And this is gonna give our sequences little variances from shot to shot, and those variances are what cause flicker. Tip number three, turn off all your camera's auto functions. So turn off your camera's noise reduction, your image playback, image stabilization, etc. The reason why is because you don't need them. You're gonna be shooting at your lowest possible ISO, so you won't really have noise, and noise reduction can also be done in Lightroom. But the biggest reason is, features like noise reduction increase your camera's read and write time, and depending on how long or short your interval is, this can really screw up your intervals. These also drain your battery faster, which can be an issue for longer sequences on mirrorless cameras. Tip number four, shoot wide open. Shooting wide open means opening up the aperture to its widest setting on the lens. The reason is the smaller your aperture of your lens is, the more room for error every time you take an image. So for example, here's a time-lapse I set up of my camera taking a time-lapse and you can see that the iris is moving quite a bit. It's these little movements that when at a higher aperture, like it increases the chance of causing flicker. Now, the only time I would say that you can ignore this rule because I admit I am constantly shooting between f8 and f11 is because I use a soft software called LR Time Lapse to deflicker my sequences and I follow rule number five which is to drag the shutter. Also the 180 rule. Dragging the shutter means to take a longer exposure. The 180 rule is a videography term that says your shutter speed should be half of your frame rate. We can apply that to our time lapses by making our shutter speed half of our interval. So if our interval is six seconds, in a perfect world, we would take a photo with a three second exposure. Now, don't get too hung up on your shutter speed being a perfect half all the time. It's just a guideline to help you make sure that you get better results. The real point of this is just to make sure that you're getting cinematic looking motion blur and gives you the ability to shoot at higher apertures without flicker. Here's a time-lapse scene with no motion blur and one with motion blur. The one with motion blur has a much smoother effect, which in my opinion is more visual appealing. Now you may be asking yourself, Scott, if we're supposed to be shooting wide open in the middle of the day, how are we going to be doing a long exposure? Which brings me to tip number six, get yourself some ND filters. ND filters, known as neutral density filters, are incredibly important. And I have quite a few ND filters from 10 stops all the way to four stops. And if you plan on doing time lapses during the day, I definitely recommend getting a 10 stop ND filter. Try to avoid cheap ND filters because these tend to have a color cast, making your shots have a tinge green or purple or yellow or whatever. I've used quite a few and I really like and can recommend Hoya ND filters. And more recently, I've been using the Polar Pro ND filters, which have become my favorite ND filters that I've ever used. Tip number seven, edit with LR time lapse. This is the de facto software for time lapsing. It's easy to use, you simply press buttons from left to right and edit a couple photos in Lightroom, save it, and it automatically does all the crazy lifting for you. It's free if you shoot under 400 photos, and it is a magical little tool that can fix just about any mistake you made, even if you didn't listen to a thing I said and shot in full automatic. Trust me, this is how you wanna be editing your time lapses, and I have a free tutorial explaining how to use this program. Links to all of these things that I'm referencing are in the, in the description of this video. Tip number eight, use an electronic shutter. A lot of newer cameras have an electronic shutter or the ability to suit in what's called silent mode. If yours is one of those, use it. One, a camera shutter lasts about 500,000 shutters. Maybe I'm making that up. If you use an electronic shutter, you're saving the camera's lifespan. Tip number nine, Learn your intervals. An interval refers to the amount of time that should lapse between each photo. For example, this sequence is shot at a six second interval, meaning that the camera fired off a photo every six seconds. The interval you choose has a huge impact on the final video because if the interval is too short, not enough movement happens. But if the interval is too long, the movement happens too quickly. Here are some great rule of thumbs I use when shooting certain subjects. People in traffic, I use the interval of one to two seconds. For clouds, I use an interval between six to 10 seconds. For stars, 20 to 40 seconds. For sunrises and sunsets, I'll shoot an interval of 10 seconds and at least one hour before and one hour after the sun is rising or the sun is setting. Tip number 10, use good composition. 
Composition is just as important in time lapse as it is in traditional photography or video. And the rule of thirds is your friend, but use it with a purpose. If the sky is the focal point, make sure that it takes up two thirds of the frame. If it's not and it's a boring sky, only have it take up one third of the frame. You can channel your inner Wes Anderson and use symmetry, or you can find frames and shadows to create depth and use leading lines to have strong composition in your time lapse. If you can add them all together, it makes for an even more powerful effect. Tip number 11, add some movement. Movement is a great tool to add to a time lapse to make it more dynamic and create interest. You can do this with a hyperlapse or a slider and get some really awesome camera movements. But even if you don't have a slider or feel like doing a hyperlapse, you can still animate a digital zoom or a digital pan to give it some extra dimension. Another cool thing is you can even bring a vertical time lapse into After Effects and add a 3D camera to create some really fun camera moves. Here's a static time lapse of Grand Central Terminal, but when I bring it into After Effects, I can create a 3D camera and give it a realistic tilt effect. Hat tip to Australian videographer Dave Kateg for showing me that trick, but my point here is even if you have limitations with your gear or your budget, don't let it stop you from getting creative. All right, tip number 12, use ambient noises. Audio is 50% of the video experience. Use it to your advantage. The great thing is you don't need to be a master sound designer to be able to add some ambient noises and bring depth to your videos. Grab your phone and record some ambient noise for 30 seconds out while you're out shooting. Also, please note, not every time lapse needs to have the most epic Nordic God of Thunder soundtrack or dubstep. And I know I'm guilty of making this mistake and doing it. I mean, uh, what was I thinking? All right, tip number 13, calculate the hyperfocal distance. This is a big one. The hyperfocal distance is essentially the distance we should focus at to maximize our focus. It basically is the distance where everything one third in front of our camera and our hypofocal distance is acceptably sharp and in focus, as well as everything beyond also being acceptably sharp and in focus. It sounds really difficult and I'm sure the math really is, but there's an awesome free app called Focus Finder that allows you to plug in your camera body, tell it your lens, and it'll tell you the hyperfocal distance of your setup. Then you just dial that into your, into your focus wheel and no more blurry time lapses. Bonus tip number 14, shoot at least 10 seconds of time lapse. The reason why is it's way easier to have more footage and speed it up than it is to try to slow down footage that you simply don't have. And also, if you ever try to plan on selling stock footage, 10 seconds seems to be the sweet spot. These will often get used as cutaways or establishing scenes on TV shows, some commercials, TV ads, TV displays at Best Buy, whatever. They typically only want three to 10 seconds of a clip at a time. And that is all I can think of for now. If you have any tips that I didn't mention, please leave them in the comments below. I'm always keen on learning new things that maybe I'm not thinking about. And if you learned anything from this video, please be sure to subscribe because I'll be sharing more time-lapse and hyperlapse tips and tricks. Let me know what you'd like to learn about. Otherwise, in my next video, I'm gonna be showing you how to do this cool hyper zoom effect. My goal with this channel is to share things that I'm learning and passionate about. So lastly, if you wanna learn more about time-lapse and hyperlapse photography, I do have a course called Hyperflow Masterclass where I teach everything I've ever learned about time-lapse and hyperlapse and blending them all together into make these seamless videos. Well, that's it for this video. Happy shooting, and I'll see you next time.